All right, good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Digital Tribal PIR Day presentations. My name is Landon Charlo. I will be doing a two-part video series. Um, this is video number one. Um, it's entitled Mapping GIS and Environmental Education, Increasing Student Interest in STEM Using Web-Based Mapping Technologies Situated Within a Land Education Framework. Just a little background about myself. Um, I am from Arley, Montana. I graduated high school there. I'm enrolled in the Flathead Indian Reservation. I'm Flathead Salish, but I'm also Blackfeet on my mother's side. I've done all of my college education at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. I have a bachelor's of science and a master's of science in natural resource sciences. Currently, I'm a third year PhD student in educational psychology. And within educational psychology, I'm studying science education, environmental education. So I am able to put to good use uh, some of my um, things I've learned from my bachelor's and master's program. Um, but more specifically, I guess, more holistically, I'm interested in uh, Native American education, uh, improving science education for Native American students, specifically those who are um, going to school on reservations. My email, if you do have any questions, it's L-C-H-A-R-L-O at WCU.edu. Just a little background about um, why I got interested in uh, environmental science. Um, I grew up um, going outside quite a bit, um, hunting and fishing, and I always just really, um, I always wanted to make sure that the environment was protected and that it was clean, resources continue to be renewable. So really sort of, uh, like it was, uh, like it was uh, I guess a strong emotional response to being outdoors. Um, and as a master's uh, student, I got to spend a lot of time in the Northern Cascade Mountain Range. Um, the picture, the map uh, in the upper right hand corner uh, is my study area. It's called Spada Lake, Washington. And in, in that project, in that research project, I studied Peleated Woodpecker Habitat. Um, specifically, I was looking at um, how does the amount of dead woody debris, primarily in the form of um, standing dead trees, how does that affect pileated woodpecker uh, population um, and their range of, range of distribution around this lake? So one of the big skills that you learn, um, especially with software that you learn uh, as a master student in natural resources is how to use uh, Arc, ArcMap, ArcGIS. Um, that's probably the most well-known software program that we use and that's you know, all about mapping. Um, so the the, uh, the map of Spada Lake on the upper right, that's a map that I used that I put into my uh, thesis. Um, so that's, so those are some of the reasons that really got me interested in um, really combining, uh, I guess you call them Western science technologies with uh, uh, Native American culture. Um, that's what, at this point, that's um, my background. So Moving on. Uh, so some of the things that we will cover in this video series is just sort of getting familiar with maps. Um, GIS, geovisualization, spatial awareness. Um, what exactly are those? Why do I think they're important for um, science and specifically environmental education? And then we'll look into some of the educational philosophies of place-based technologies and land education frameworks. So how are they how are they similar? How do they maybe oppose each other? Um, what are some of the uh, recommendations by uh, Native American education researchers um, and the best way to sort of teach uh, American Indian students? And then the one uh, map that I will introduce is topography maps. Um, the United States Geological Service, um, they provide free US maps, um, US topo maps. So we'll, we'll go into the process of downloading them. Um, and then also topographic interpretation. So how, from maps, from these topographic maps, how can we make sense uh, of, of the shape of the land and how can that increase spatial awareness? So maps, so maps have been around for a really long time and originally they were primarily used just for um, mapping, um, mapping land masses. Um, they have their roots in cartography, which is the creation of uh, graphic symbol representations of features of parts of the surface of the earth. So a lot of this was how to do with you know, exploration and mapping out um, 
unknown territories. Um, one of the things that you first learn when you get into uh, GIS and start working with maps uh, is that people intuitively trust maps. There's been a lot of surveys um, that people you know, asked on how confident they are that a map is a true representation. Um, most people's responses are pretty high. You have, um, this map in the lower right, um, it looks pretty complicated. It looks like there was a lot of um, you know, work and effort and it's probably constructed by a team. And I think a lot of people just um, feel that there's a large amount of sort of uh, administrative evaluation and approval that goes into making maps. And that, that is definitely true. Um, but today in, with web-based mapping, um, beginning users can make maps. Um, and in a way, um, there may be some ethical concerns with map making. For one, all maps have some element of distortion. It's incredibly difficult to represent uh, a spherical Earth, a globe, um, which is three-dimensional, onto a two-dimensional flat circle, whether that be paper maps or whether that be a computer screen. One of the most popular examples of this is Greenland. Uh, Greenland, in actuality, is roughly um, the same size as Mexico, but on most world maps, it looks usually 20, 30 times larger. And that's because the lines of latitude at the equator are further apart than they are at the poles. The closer you get to the poles, um, the lines of longitude uh, basically converge, continue to converge um, until they get to the center point of the pole. They're all getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you stretch that out on a flat map, it expands the size of Greenland. So there definitely are some ethical issues with map making, um, especially with new developers, people who don't really have a lot of experience. Um, and there are a lot of different types of maps. Uh, I guess, you know, especially with in the computer age, um, the web-based age, um, making maps um, through web-based technologies are ever expanding uh, day by day. One of the most popular maps that you will see um, are chloropleth maps. Uh, those are, that, for, for example, that's a map in the lower right um, that, usually, that usually displays some type of social construct or, or an opinion. This map, for example, is confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the United States, cases per 100,000. Um, seems pretty trustworthy, but um, if you look at the legend, um, you'll see that um, different counties are represented by different uh, numerical categories. And the user can um, develop those categories or construct those categories um, almost any way they want. So that's one way that you can sort of skew the data in what you're, in what you're representing. So I just wanna make it known that there are ethical issues with maps. Um, I'm promoting maps, but I'll be the first person to admit that you know, they're not always exact reality and they can be manipulated. But one of the great things I have come across recently is, um, is that tribes and indigenous communities are using maps a lot more. Uh, the map in the middle that represents, um, that was a map that was made by someone who was representing um, the areas where traditional Native American uh, languages were spoken. Uh, all of those polygons rep represents the home area of, of, of a tribe and their language. So I think that um, what I'm really hopeful for is that the, uh, indigenous communities, tribal communities, will continue to use maps um, for educational purposes. I think it's a really vital tool. And the map in the upper right, that is a topographic map. Um, topographic maps are lines that have uh, contour lines of equal elevation. So every, so you can see those, all those uh, meandering lines. They're all uh, lines of equal elevation. So it really gets at the heart of elevation, elevation increase or de decrease. And that's really helpful for, um, for having the lines sort of interpret the shape of the land. And as, a, as someone who's worked with maps for a while, I'm really a proponent of um, you know, first teaching maps to you know, junior high age students or um, college age students. I think that topo maps are a great uh, sort of foundation get your head around spatial awareness and sort of that interpretive thinking. So moving on to GIS. So GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. Um, 
GIS is highly multidisciplinary. There's a lot of um, individual disciplines that go into it. Uh, the definition is um, a computer-based system to aid the collection, maintenance, storage, analysis, output, and distribution of spatial data and information. Um, a lot of times when people know that I work with uh, GIS, I've taken a lot of GIS classes, um, initially they say, so is that, is that like GPS? Well, um, uh, GPS is one element of it. That's um, that diagram that I've provided. Um, that's more of the, 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 the satellite system. Um, it usually takes uh, three, at least three satellites um, in the atmosphere to triangulate your, uh, your position on the Earth. And the more satellites you have triangulating your position, the more accurate um, it can be. Satellites are definitely one aspect of it, um, whether it's GPS or whether um, using spatial um, uh, satellite imagery. I think the heart of GIS is actually, so the computer-based system, so the software, the data, the analysis, I feel like that's what is really driving um, GIS. Um, so with all GISs, it requires some type of data set, and that's usually called an attribute table. Um, you can sort of think of that as an Excel sheet, and, in, and uh, actually in most GIS programs, you can actually uh, upload an Excel sheet into the into the software and display that as long as it has some some type of reference point associated with that data then you can uh, display it on your computer screen but one of the things that but all of this um, would almost be pointless without uh, a skilled user so careers in gis are really exploding uh, there's so many different uh, disciplines natural resource uh, sciences and environmental, environmental science that's where I come from, but also, um, you know, the world of business, uh, political science, anthropology, uh, uh, criminal justice, all of those are using GIS a lot more than you think that they are. Um, you know, most disciplines have some type of spatial component with it, whether you're measuring crime over the, the say, the state of Washington, or you're um, digging up um, fossils across, you know, say, the lower, um, Lower Columbia Plateau, you can represent that um, through GIS, and it's a great way uh, to store information um, and display information. So that's, in a, I guess, in a nutshell, that's what GIS is. So geovisualization—that's um, something that's really a word that's sort of extended from um, GIS, with which GIS is actually a, a relatively new discipline, um, starting somewhere in the 1990s. Geovisualization is actually the, the knowledge construction, the human understanding of GIS. Uh, one of the best examples that I can think of is uh, simply the weather, the weather channel. Um, so there's nothing really inherent. So if you were to take this picture um, of the weather, um, there's nothing really inherent that says that these green, yellow, red, blue, um, purplish polygons blinking across the screen um, represent weather patterns. but um, through mapping those, through having a, an interpreter, the weather person, um, and just over time, we make, um, we're able to recognize that that is weather patterns um, over time across a specific area in the state, the lower, uh, the lower Midwest. So that, that's, um, to me, that's the best example of geovisualization that I've been able to come with, up with. Uh, I guess the formal definition by McEachern is the creation and use of visual representation to facilitate thinking, understanding, and knowledge construction. Just reading up about geovisualization, a lot of times it's used in for uh, three-dimensional um, computer programs, but I think that it also, um, if we're thinking about as knowledge construction, can be applied to uh, something like uh, two-dimensional um, topographic maps that are represented on a piece of paper. So. And to me, that's, that's, that's really important, being able to take an abstract concept that we see and then make sense of that. Okay, so spatial awareness, spatial thinking, spatial reasoning. I think that is very important. Um, a website that I like um, is Learning to Think Spatially. Uh, they say that spatial thinking is powerful and pervasive, underpinning everyday life, work, and science. It plays a role in activities, ranging from understanding metaphors, becoming good at wayfinding, and interpreting works of art. 
to engaging in molecular modeling, generating geometry proofs, and interpreting astronomical data. So although we don't think of it, I think that because um, just the spatial aspect of our world and very being is um, highly spatial, we think spatially, um, we live in a spatial world, that spatial thinking is um, sort of overlooked, but um, like most everything else, you can increase your level of spatial reasoning. There's been research. Um, another website that I like to go to is Healthline. Um, they say that spatial awareness has many benefits. Um, some of those are have to do with uh, location, movement. Um, there's a social aspect, um, reading and writing, and mathematics. So I'll pause for a second and I'll let you uh, read through these, and then we'll continue on in just a few seconds. Okay, so spatial awareness has many benefits. And one of, um, I may be a little biased, but I think that one of the best ways to increase your spatial awareness, spatial reasoning is being out in the environment, um, taking a map, going for a hike, identifying where you are. And believe it or not, even getting lost <laughs> might be one of the best way to build those um, neural connections of finding your back, finding your way back to a known point using a map when you actually are lost. I've done that before. <laughs> Um, and so I think that there's a great benefit to just being out in the actual environment. Okay, so what are some of the actual uh, specific characteristics of spatial thinking and spatial awareness? Most of these are relatively easy concepts, such as what is near, um, what is far, how do I choose a path, what shares a border, um, the cardinal directions such as north, south, east, west, um, you know, using a compass, um, knowing that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, um, being able to tell what is north, what is south, just by this position of the sun, that's a great uh, spatial uh, awareness activity. Um, and just developing spatial relationships, understanding spatial relationships in general. Um, one of the things that I try to teach um, is spatial reasoning. So con whether in almost any scientific discipline you go into, You'll be measuring volume, measuring area, and those all have uh, US standard um, measurements as well as metric measurements. Um, myself, I've worked with quite a few uh, international students and researchers. So you just kind of have to get used to um, take for area example too. I usually think of area in terms of acres, but you know, people from other countries uh, refer to area in terms of hectares. So you have to sort of be able to compare and contrast and um, understand, you know, how big is one acre compared to uh, one hectare. When, when someone says, uh, my study area was 300 hectares, um, then you kind of are able to quickly um, assess, okay, I understand that that's a certain amount of um, acres. So I think that's a, uh, that's a really important skill for um, increasing spatial reasoning. But really at the heart of spatial thinking, spatial awareness is that connectedness. So for me, this connectedness comes in two forms. Um, how does the land connect with itself? Um, in video number two, I will be um, introducing a lot of uh, ecological concepts, environmental um, sort of landscape ecology terms, um, so understanding how elevation affects um, um, species distribution, whether it be plants or animals. So that's one aspect of it that I'll be covering more detail in uh, video number two. Um, but something that I think is really important culturally, especially for American Indian students, uh, is, is this connectedness um, that the land has to culture. And so this is where we get into some of the, um, I guess you could say, indigenous educational philosophies. And one of the authors that I really like who's been developing this concept is Eve Tuck. Um, and I will provide this paper um, in, the, uh, in the resources uh, for this video. Uh, but she wrote, a, she has done a lot of development of what's called a land-based education. And this really has its roots in indigenous ways of knowing, uh, traditional ways of learning. So really, you know, as it, as it states, land-based, 
really the heart of it is Center for Learning for American Indian students should be the land itself. Um, the land was here long before people were here. The land is something that shapes um, our knowledge, our beliefs, our tradition, uh, shapes our culture, the language, just about everything you know, about us and culture is shaped by the land. So um, with that, the land is, you know, has, a, has a sacredness to it. So I think that this educational framework um, is really just as simple as you know, when, uh, when uh, constructing curriculum, especially in the sciences, I think it's important to have land and culture really be the foundation of that. Another uh, educational um, indigenous uh, researcher uh, that I really like is Gregory, uh, Dr. Gregory Cahete. Um, several years ago, he uh, wrote a book chapter, um, American Indian um, Epistemologies, and a lot of that was centered around education, uh, traditional forms of education. And one section of that chapter was uh, Seven Foundations for American Indian Education. So the first one, uh, the top of the list that he recommends is environmental. Um, traditionally, we had a direct interaction with the natural world. Almost all elements of education had something to do with some aspect of the environment. Uh, second was the mythical. So these are the traditional stories of the world views. Um, a lot, traditionally, traditionally, a lot of uh, American Indian education uh, was through uh, storytelling. So that's very important, that's a big aspect. Of American Indian education, and something that I didn't mention was that uh, really at the heart of soul is map of maps is that they're uh, really made to tell some type of story. So that's another thing that really got me interested in in combining, um, I guess you could say, maps with um, Indigenous education was that they both at the heart of it. A lot of it is about around storytelling. The third foundation is visionary. So this was the psychological and spiritual understanding of your place in the world. Okay, I know who I am in this world and this is sort of the skills that I want to develop. So I think seeing yourself and what you want to do into the future. The fourth is the artistic foundation. Uh, um, traditionally, Indian Americans and in many indigenous people were highly artistic. Um, it's a form of self-expression, sort of that um, element of uh, symbolizing knowledge. Uh, the fifth foundation is, uh, was the effective. That's the emotional response to education. Um, for me, I guess you could say, um, and Kehete mentions that all of these are really interconnected with each other, some of them more than others, and some of them are more connected depending on the person. Uh, for me, I had a really strong emotional response to um, um, the environment, to being out in the environment. Uh, that's something that really motivated me. The third, or actually the sixth is communal. So this idea that every individual is a part of a community and the entire community educates. I think it's incredibly difficult to put the, the entire burden of education onto one classroom teacher. I, uh, for my, the last two years I've been working with, um, at WSU I've been working with uh, three tribes uh, building curriculum um, that is uh, that's culture based that also makes connections to science, and so one of the, so for us in building this curriculum, uh, a big part of that is uh, communal education involving elders, uh, involving language teachers, involving uh, classroom teachers, involving um, natural resource uh, professionals who are able to come in and give a guest presentation from time to time, and also family. The entire community. So I think the communal aspect is something that's really, really important. And then finally, um, the spiritual aspect. This is being deeply tied to the land, um, having a great reverence uh, for the land, for the environment, for the animals and plants. Um, so that is um, uh, a great uh, source. Um, I will also add that to, um, to my uh, video one packet. Okay, um, so place-based technologies, uh, technically GIS and maps, those are place-based technologies. And in the paper from uh, Tuck McKenzie and McCoy, 
they sort of have a, a pretty strong critique of place-based technologies um, in and of themselves, specifically the way that these place-based place technologies have been used when um, educating indigenous students. So this critique comes from the, the, the awareness that these technologies really removes almost any um, human element. So humans are really separated from nature, from place. It completely removes culture. Um, it looks at land as uh, sort of, I guess you could say, a piece of property. Um, these technologies are deeply rooted in Western science epistemologies and paradigms. They mentioned that um, these perpetuate European universalism, um, does not link place to indigenous culture at all. And it really looks at the world, looks at the land as an uh, abstract set of artesian coordinates. So, you know, breaking down locations into latitude and longitude. There's really nothing indigenous about these technologies. So I, on one side of the coin, I would definitely agree with that. Um, and I think that it's, um, it's important to make that acknowledgement but there are other indigenous researchers uh, that, you know, they do definitely acknowledge that, but um, they think that these technologies can use to be, uh, promote interest in local places. Um, Dilpart and um, Associates in 2016 wrote a paper called Promoting Geoscience STEM Interest in Native American Students. And there's a lot of GIS and geovisualization to to really connect what they were teaching to the relevancy of the students' daily lives. Uh, this last summer, I taught a three-week internship um, with a tribe teaching um, their students, um, high school age range, uh, envir environmental science. And we did use um, place-based technologies, uh, primarily ARC GIS uh, story maps. So what we did, we allowed the students to identify some um, something in the environment that they were interested in, whether it was stream restoration, uh, fisheries management, um, some type of something that was going on with the tribe that the tribe was managing. Um, and then through that, do some analysis and do some um, um, using these place based technologies, sort of tell that story. And I think that these place based technologies, um, as long as you're able to relate the curriculum so it's relevant to the students, I think that it's a can be a positive thing. Um, I found that that really increased engagement in STEM. I think that you, know, um, you really need to be careful when teaching place-based technology, especially as the students on your junior high, junior high age to high school age range. Um, that really the culture and the cultural relevancy is at the foundation and then using uh, these technologies um, to do some type of analysis or mapping. I think that that promotes interest in the technologies if we can relate it. So that's why so um, through firsthand experience, I, I, I truly believe that. Um, and in the paper, um, they gave a re really great quote um, that sort of uh, tells, tells, that whole, um, tells that whole story. Um, so they say that recent innovations in geographic information systems and geovisualization tools offer new opportunities to promoting interest in geoscience and STEM careers with Native American students. The place-based educational role is particularly suited to geoscience education and can appeal to Native American students' connection to local places. Yet the geoscience discipline is heavily imbued with Western science concepts such as uh, places, spaces, and physical processes that are not in congruence with the interconnected world of indigenous science. So I think that as long as um, Indigenous, indigenous science, culture, traditional ecological knowledge and language is at the heart of the curriculum. Using place-based technology is, is a good thing. Okay, so my personal goal as um, American Indian educator, researcher, um, I sort of developed um, a, a, a motto and that's my goal is to use place-based technologies to promote land-based indigenous culture and language curriculum and connection to the earth. Okay, so we will move on to uh, US topographic maps. That's sort of the main, the main um, technology that I will be um, going through today. 
So for the rest of the presentation, we'll be looking at uh, parts of the map um, called the usual map elements, uh, reading contour lines. For me, I really like this. Uh, once I understood um, sort of how to read contour lines, I just downloaded a bunch of topographic maps and just had a lot of fun with that. Um, and also a good strategy is, you know, um, getting these maps and actually going out to the actual site. Um, I think that's really important is uh, teaching outdoors, the actual environment. Um, thirdly, we'll be converting distances between meters, kilometers, feet, and miles. Um, I just think that unit conversions is a really great skill to have if you're going into the sciences, um, understand, understanding map scale, uh, determining percent slope and difficulty of terrain. Um, I'm definitely not a mathematician. I never taught math. Um, and this is probably where the communal foundation comes in. Um, as described by Kahete. Um, but I think that with topographic maps, um, you can sort of teach mathematical principles, uh, whether it's geometry or you know, early trigonometry, um, determining percent slope, degrees, um, properties of a triangle. So that's something that I probably need a little bit of help with, but I think that is, I think with these topographic maps, it is possible to teach math without, without explicitly teaching math. So you can teach math without it, um, without the, without it seeming like it's math. So I think that's um, probably motivating. It's motivating for me. <laughs> um, and then we will download uh, these topographic maps from the USGS website. Uh, they are free. So we'll go through that process. I did construct a little uh, Word document that's also a tutorial. Um, so I definitely will share that as well. And then finally, we will go through a little guided exploration um, of the Arley Quadrangle. So I did search for some YouTube videos that I thought explained um, how to read topographic maps really well. Um, there's some great videos and there's some not so great videos. But I put two of them on there. And uh, just for the sake of time, I don't think that I will be able to um, explain uh, topographic maps, uh, um, reading them in great detail, but uh, these videos will definitely um, help you in that process. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the USGS website. I have provided the link, so we will go ahead and click on that. Sometimes um, these websites can be a little slow, but it looks like it's going pretty fast today. Um, okay, so firstly, I wanted to um, show you a document that I developed. Well, actually, um, myself and um, my master's uh, program advisor, uh, Dr. Mark Swanson, developed. Um, so these are um, classroom activities, outdoor activities, that you could possibly do with your students. This, if this is a route that you want to go um, in uh, increasing students' uh, ability to use maps and spatial reasoning. So we titled it Map Exploration, Exploration and Navigation. So becoming familiar with parts of the map and also just navigating. So one thing that I didn't include in this video, number one, that I really promote is um, using a compass, understanding parts of a compass, and coupling that with maps and then being able to navigate out in the real world. Um, something that I found is uh, recently uh, is that teaching students how to uh, use a compass over, over something like Zoom is incredibly difficult. So I think that until we're able to meet in person, um, I think the best way to teach compassing and navigation is in person. That's how I learned. That's how most everyone who I know Bit of what the map of compass learned. Um, so I think that you know, if there is interest, um, and then once um, once uh, once the uh, um, we're able to meet back in person uh, in educational purposes, maybe next summer sometime, I could hold a, um, maybe a, an outdoor session where we teach compass compasses. But so anyhow, um, there's a lot of great activities in here. Um, what are maps? Um, maps. The most important map, um, this comes from my instructor, um, is that map, the most important map is in your mind. You know, we think spatially. Um, we can close our eyes and you know, navigate around, uh, you know, in a rehearse uh, hike or 
getting from point A to point B. So mapping is actually very much more mental than, than most people think it is. Um, traditionally, the tribes drew maps on deerskin and bark. Um, something that I will also be getting into um, in video number two is um, when I cover um, traditional ecological knowledge, is the idea of bounded space um, and uh, traditional navigation. So that was really interesting to me and I'm uh, excited to uh, go over that in video number two. Uh, so I won't be able to go through all of this uh, document in, in great detail, but um, I will share this with you. It will be in the, uh, I guess my, my curriculum packet that I'm providing, but this also goes into great detail of you know, becoming familiar with parts of the map. Um, some exercises using um, the United States Geolog Geological Survey maps, um, identifying, um, uh, identifying physical features, uh, understanding map scale, map direction. All of these are increasing spatial reasoning and spatial awareness. Um, reading a compass, um, azimuth, um, you know, so from a, on a zero to 360 degree scale, um, identifying becoming familiar with the cardinal directions and understanding that east is 90 degrees, um, you know, concepts like west is 270 degrees. Um, so that's really sort of um, important. Uh, contour lines, we have a little bit, broken down a little bit more, uh, these contour lines and sort of, a, sort of a guided exploration. So we will make that um, available for you. Uh, basic pacing, Coupling pacing with um, certain distances, whether it's 50 feet, 100, 100 feet, or yards. So you'll be able to uh, assess horizontal, dif uh, horizontal dif uh, distance, how far you're walking. Um, so there's a, those are there for you. And um, also, I developed uh, guided instructions paired with pictures about how to uh, download these uh, topographic maps from the um, USGS website. So I will go back to the USGS website and that link will bring you to the National Geospatial Program. And you can see this US Topo Maps. I'll click on the green button and that will bring you to uh, download Topo Maps of the United States. So click launch. Sometimes it takes a while. Okay, so it brings you to this page. This is where you actually download it. Uh, you have a window view of the United States. So anywhere in the United States, you can download these topo maps. Uh, so you usually want to make that uh, make sure that the correct boxes are checked. So U.S. topo maps is checked. Um, usually want to use this uh, U.S. topo map current. Uh, make sure it says 7.5 by 7.5 minutes. Um, and geo, uh, geo PDF or geo TIFF. Um, I've used both, and it seems like it both downloads the same PDF, so I'm not quite sure what the difference is, um, but just usually that's, uh, make sure all those boxes are checked. Um, click, so first you wanna zoom into your area, so we will zoom in to R. Lee, the R. Lee quadrangle. And you can zoom into a certain area, and then so you can see all of the quadrangles that are available. So I see our quadrangle is labeled. Every uh, every uh, rectangle is a 7.5 by 7.5 minute uh, quadrangle. So then you click Find Products, and that will um, click Results, and that brings up all of the topo maps that are in this window view. Um, R. Lee is the first one, so. We can see it's USGS, US Topo 7.5 minute map um, for Arley, Montana, 2020, so the most current. So click download. And usually this is pretty quick. It's downloading, okay, so it downloaded completely. And when you bring it up, or click it up, it just comes up as a PDF. So I won't get in, uh, Go into too much detail about uh, topo maps. There's a lot. There's a lot of information uh, to them. Uh, but every map has a title. So this one is Arley Quadrangle Montana 7.5 minute series. Um, the numbers on the corners are longitude and latitude. Uh, you can see these grid lines. Um, those are uh, 
um, more spatial reference numbers, those are UTMs, um, I won't get too much in that. I, I don't think that that's, um, that would really come into play when developing curriculum for uh, junior high and high school age students. So I'm just gonna kind of skip over that, just trying to touch on the main points. Okay, so what is probably the most important is the information provided on the bottom. And let me zoom in just a little bit. Uh, for some reason, zooming into these seems to be relatively slow. So it'll take me a couple of clicks to get zoomed into the scale that I want to zoom into. Just one more click. Okay, so the information on the left uh, produced by the United States Geological Survey. So this is all of the data that went into producing this maps. Um, maps, um, all maps, contour maps, Web-based maps, they have a lot of data layers to them. Um, so this is everything that went into this. And this is, this is information that's really important um, um, as far as developing a map, but as far as teaching maps, it's, it's, I don't think it's all that important at, at, at this stage. Uh, scrolling across to the right, so we have a relatively technical compass rows um, showing you where Magnorth magnetic north is, grid north, and true north. Um, if I was teaching compasses, this would be important, but um, since I don't, at this point, um, since we're not using um, compass as part of the curriculum development, I think we can just probably skip over compass rows, although it is um, important. Very rarely do you see um, a map where the north isn't up. Um, very rarely do you see that. But it's important when you are learning maps to understand what a compass rose is. Um, some of the more important um, elements are scale. So almost all of these uh, US topo maps are on a 1 to 24,000 scale. So that means that one inch on the map represents 24,000 inches um, out on the ground, out, the, out, on the, uh, out in reality, out, on the, out in the environment. So right there, we're actually um, using concepts of um, understanding scale and scale conversion. Uh, so we know that, okay, one inch um, equals 24,000 inches in the real world, but how, how many feet is that? Um, how many meters is that? Kilometers. And so those are exercises that you can do um, to start to get to students um, sort of wrapping their head around this idea of um, understanding that the same distance can be represented in different units. So that's a concept that's really important. Um, or, um, for STEM education. Um, and then we have our scale bars. And I really like these because they come in feet, miles, meters, and kilometers. So it's really easy to sort of visually assess um, how many, um, you know, approximately how far 1,000 feet is um, on this map and how that relates to miles. How many miles is that? Um, how many kilometers is that? Meters. Um, so just looking at the scale bar, um, you know, for a certain amount of time, you just, you're able to develop a certain amount of spatial awareness and reasoning just right there. But probably the most important piece of information uh, is how far apart are the contour lines? Remember, these are um, vertical intervals. So every contour line, one contour to the next, represents 40 vertical feet change, whether it could be up or down. So that's really important. When you're doing some of the uh, uh, activities, outdoor activities that I'll be uh, uh, bringing us through here in just a second. Um, okay, if you keep scrolling on to the right, um, you can see where um, the Arley Quadrangle is situated within the state of Montana. Um, you can see the uh, all of the surrounding quadrangles, and then also uh, physical features such as roads. Um, U.S. routes, and then the name of the quadrangle, Harley Montana 2020. Okay, so I let's switch over to another map that I downloaded. So just looking around, just becoming familiar with some of the features. Um, so we have the Jocko River uh, running through the Jocko Valley right near Arley. So almost all bodies of water, whether it be creeks, rivers, streams, lakes, uh, they're represented in blue with blue text, so that sort of helps you differentiate between roads. A lot of the riparian areas are represented in this 
by some type of light green shading with some type of representation, a symbol of aquatic invitation, uh, aquatic vegetation. So that's represented in, uh, near the Jocko River. Um, probably one of the most important things to recognize is that the further the lines are spaced apart, the flatter the ground is. So we can see around our um, around um, the areas north of Arley. Those are relatively flat. If you've ever driven through, um, you, can, uh, um, you can attest to that. Uh, that's relatively flat. And then if you look to the northwest, we have uh, mountains. And the steeper it is, the closer they are. So we can see that um, if we're going from Arley um, going northeast, uh, relatively flat. And then once we get to the, to the toe slope of the mountain, that it starts increasing in elevation rather quickly. A lot of these lines are pretty closely spaced together. So um, the vertical rise is increasing dramatically. And one of the interesting things to point out is um, if you look at some of these creeks, for example, the Covey Creek, um, we can see that the contour lines in relation to the creek, it looks like they're, um, the contour lines are um, sort of develop, developing this V shape. So that's a dead giveaway, um, that V shapedness, whether you're looking at a mountain ridge or usually some type of, uh, uh, some type of stream streams cut cut through the earth so they're usually a depression so a rule number one is if you're following a stream on a contour map that um, it's going to create a v-shaped and the point of the v the shape is pointing to the source of the water so a v-shape is pointing um, upstream so that's you know right away we'll be able to um, identifying features of the land and so for example if you take the pelu creek and if you kind of go up the hill a little bit and down you can see Okay, um, near the creek, the contour lines are pointing up. I think we can see, okay, now we can see some, some of the contour lines are starting to point downwards. So that, so that represents a ridge. So that's how you can tell a ridge uh, versus a creek depression. So right there, we're sort of uh, kind of understanding the shape of the land just based upon these contour lines. And another, another uh, feature to point out is that um, if you see a circle, that usually means that you're looking at some type of some type of peak, some type of mountaintop, because you can only go so high in elevation on the mountaintops and then there's no more um, elevation land mass. Um, so circle usually means um, um, a peak, or if you see these tick marks around it, usually means some type of depression. So um, I, so before this uh, presentation, I uh, downloaded this Arley uh, topo map and I marked out um, A Hill. If anyone's been to A Hill, as you're driving through town, if you look slightly southwest, you'll see our A Hill. There's a big, big white A on a hill. <laughs> That's A Hill. Um, so I thought an interesting outdoor activity would be to, you know, possibly, um, you know, go out to Finley Creek. So that's the, that's the X, um, that's the north facing X. And then say if we wanted to walk from X um, down by Finley Creek up to, up to the X um, on the, the little um, the peak of that hill um, walking through through the A. So this could be possible one possible exercise that you could do maybe with a student someday. So not all contour lines are marked uh, with an elevation. So this is in feet. Um, the the contour lines that are marked with an elevation are called index contour lines. So if you so say for example the the uh, the contour line that I marked with an X down by Finley Creek. Um, we can see the closest contour uh, line is 3,200 feet. And we know from our map legend that every contour line is 40 feet apart. So we can count downhill. So one, two, three, four, uh, four contour lines down. Uh, that's approximately the elevation that will be. So four times 40 is 160. So we will be subtracting 160 from 320, and that is 340 feet. So our starting point would be approximately 340 feet. So if we were marked to walk from the X down at Finley Creek up to the X at the top of the hill, take a little hike up A Hill, uh, we would get to the point. And so how many feet in elevation would that be? So we find the nearest contour interval that's marked. So it's 3,600. Um, we count how many intervals up to the top. So we got one, two, three, four, five interval lines, so that's approximately 200 feet. So 
3,600 plus 8 plus 200 is 3,800 feet. So change in elevation, we would have walked a vertical distance of 760 feet. And previously, I was interested in how many horizontal feet, so I used our uh, horizontal um, uh, our horizontal marker here. Um, and I measured it out, and approximately we would have went horizontal distance approximately 2,200 feet. Um, so, um, so now how can we calculate rise over run? So that would be okay. We rose 700 feet, 60 feet in vertical elevation. Um, we traversed 2,200 feet in horizontal distance. So if you were to do the math, that would come out to approximately 34.5 uh, percent percent rise in elevation. And this is where you can kind of get into those geometric and um, I guess you could say uh, mathematical principles. So you can start doing things like rise over run. So ultimately what we did just do, we just uh, sort of uh, um, marked out a triangle. Um, so you can use uh, Pythagorean's theorem. you know, and now we have a squared plus b squared equals c squared, finding the hypotenuse. So I think things like that. So um, I think that being able to incorporate uh, mathematical um, exercises with these topographic maps uh, is, is, uh, is somewhat easy to do. Uh, okay, so that um, I have been timing myself. I have seen that I've gone just over 15 minutes. Um, so with that, I'd like to wrap up video number one. And uh, let me get back to my PowerPoint. Um, so this um, wraps up video number one. Um, thank you for, very much for attending, and I hope this was of use. And if you do have any questions, feel free to email me at any time. Um, in our next video, we will be covering uh, web-based mapping, specifically looking at uh, Google Earth, um, ArcMap, Story Maps, and another software program that's called Tour Builder. And with that, we will be integrating um, Western ecological science as well as traditional ecological science. So with that, I will conclude um, video number one. Thank you very much and see you on the next video.